Welcome to Playground Books, essays revisiting the stories I first read as a kid and loved enough to spend my recesses reading. There are books I know you've read, at least if you're around my age. The Magic Tree Houses, the Nancy Drews, and I've even had a few people mention The Secrets of Droon to me, and I could talk for hours about Droon, don't worry, we'll get there. But in terms of formative literature, which is really what I'm interested in and why I'm talking to you now, there's also the strange little books, in back corners of school libraries and dusty basements of bookstores. The ones you don't bring up in nostalgia conversations, because you're never quite sure if you imagine them, if maybe somehow you had the only copy, a fluke of literary accidents. There are books you read when you're little that run through your head like water, books that perch and fly off with feathers floating in their wake. Books that leave impressions the same way that melting snow and crumbling cookies do. And then there are the ones that refuse to leave. For me, that's a little book that I'm not sure anyone outside Mrs. H's third grade class has any memories of. I want to talk to you about Marco's Millions. Marco's Millions was written by William Slater and published in 2001. It's a short science fiction chapter book, a couple hundred pages. My copy is… you could call it well-loved. You could also say it barely has a spine anymore, and every time I open it, I'm afraid the cover is going to come off in my hands. Its pages have that almost feathery texture of soft paper that's been flipped too many times. I rescued it during my third grade teacher's end-of-year purge of her class bookshelf, so I know it's been read by dozens of students, years of students before me. We start out with a 12-year-old boy named Marco, his two younger sisters, Lily and Ruth, and their big, worn-to-pieces house. It's a house that has history and secrets. Their aunt disappeared as a child and was never found, and Lily is just as strange as she was. There are mysteries here. That's what we start out with. After introductions, Lily takes Marco down to a root cellar in the basement, where she's found a doorway that only she can see, but when she's touching Marco, he can pass through it as well. Beyond that wall, we have entered a world of Lovecraft, of H.G. Wells, of Kafka, a dim, shadow metropolis not concerned with being welcoming. A race of bug-like people are performing an elaborate ritual with a swing, Picture the kind of carnival ride of a giant viking boat that nearly turns upside down. They need Marco's help. Really, they need Lily's help. She's the closest this book has to a chosen one. The special child with impossible abilities called to be the savior of an alien race. But she's too frightened and sickly, so Marco volunteers in her stead. The problem is that time passes differently in this other place. A few minutes is hours in the real world because on the horizon is what looks like a mangled, angry star, and turns out to be a naked singularity that's bending space-time around it. A naked singularity, in short, is a theoretical space phenomena, where a collapsing star doesn't form a black hole around itself like usual, and instead, light can escape, warped and transmuted unpredictably by the gravitational forces. To buy the time they need, the kids lie to their parents about Marco staying with a friend over the weekend, and he embarks on the adventure. There's this trick, a thing I like to keep in mind when writing. I heard it a long time ago, I don't remember where, but it tells you to ask, what is this book about? That's about with a capital A. I can tell you easily what the story's about, as in what's the plot, who are the characters, how are they moving around in what kind of world, but what the story's really about is deeper than that, maybe akin to theme. It's about family. It's about finding your place in the world. It's about justice and good versus evil, or maybe just learning to believe in yourself. In the case of Marco's Millions, it's about, lowercase, a boy who trips into a science fiction world and has to complete a dangerous trial, making massive sacrifices that he doesn't realize until later. 
but what it's really about is the wonder and lingering danger of travel. Marco is, at heart, a traveler. We're told he was taking buses and trains as young as five just to ride the routes. The book is called Marco's Millions for this desire to go very, very far away. What makes him so interesting to me, both now and when I first read the book, is the self-assuredness he has to force himself out of his comfort zone. It's more than that. It's almost as if this state of slight danger, being immersed in something totally foreign and unknown, is his comfort zone. Yet that doesn't lead him to be arrogant or self-important, partly because he knows and is told often that he is, in effect, Lily's avatar in this quest. He is not here for the glory, he is here for the voyage. A lot of attention in the book is given to Marco's interactions with the race of strange, bug-like creatures that live in the world beyond his basement wall. Here's the way his first meeting with them is described. The creatures crowded around the edges of the square, creatures like insects with six limbs and ridged, carapest heads. They constantly moved their heads slightly back and forth. He couldn't see any eyes on them. Perhaps their sense of sight was somehow different from human beings. He concentrated on looking at the creatures and did his best to keep his eyes away from the distant, monstrous thing behind them. Suddenly, a creature at a booth glanced at him. Again, he froze, his heart pounding in his neck. He started to turn to run away, but the creature didn't threaten him. It bowed politely, putting its two front limbs to its forehead and lowering its head. Greetings. Have you eaten yet? That will be five tigles to get inside. Sleater pulls this great little trick here, where the syntax and vocabulary of the creatures is like an incomplete translation. The idioms don't match. Their greeting is have you eaten yet, and they say they want to meet Lily so they can teach her how to be polite and other things too. There's an extra layer of formality and politeness to everything they say. It's not just characterization, but culture formation. And it's effective in making them feel alien, even more so than the descriptions of their insectoid bodies. This is also coupled with the fact that all of their communication is telepathic. So even though the conversations with Marco are written out like dialogue, it's all in italics rather than quotes, which gives the time spent in their world an odd, distanced atmosphere like you're underwater or, fittingly, outside of time. Another element to their culture that's touched on is the class structure. Yes, there's an emphasis on politeness and ceremony, but inextricable from that is showmanship. And in showmanship, there are spectators and there are the gladiators. Marco notices and is unsettled by the difference between the fat, rich creatures jeering on the ritual and those of the lowest class, modeled and underfed, who risk death to bear the burden enacting it. Marco goes through the ritual with the swing, saved by telepathic intervention from Lily, and winning a box that's at the top of the ark. Next, he must travel to the Singularity, and the creatures, they don't explain any of this to him until it's too late, but the closer you get to the Singularity, the slower time moves for you. Back in the real world, Marco has gone missing. I should say that the creatures aren't named in the book, which is maybe apt, they're used to the negotiation between their race and the bizarre and terrifying naked singularity looming too low on their horizon, with the human medium as an interloper. Marco was just the current one. Before him, the medium was his aunt, Martha, the one that disappeared as a child. We'll come back to her. For the creatures, the singularity is ingrained in their culture to an almost religious extent. They call it the unknowable, and treat it as though it has some kind of sentience, which can be communicated with through the control box that Marco wins in the ritual, and also what's called a master control box, which has been stolen. These boxes can manipulate the bearer's personal time and gravity. Heavier equals slower, and the rest of the universe whizzes by as you inch toward immortality. It's Einstein's relativity. All of this is part of life for these creatures, so it does make sense how little they slow down to explain things to Marco even things as simple as what they're called. In that way, the book makes you feel like being a tourist, just seeing so much you don't understand, but that nevertheless is commonplace. The way Marco interacts with their culture is fascinating. After the initial shock, there's no fear or xenophobia, but instead he's investigative, curious, frustrated when their rituals don't make sense to him or create what he feels are arbitrary obstacles, but still, there's a definite feeling of Marco being the one who doesn't belong, 
doesn't understand. The traveler in an unfamiliar land with intricacies and a deep history. When he finally reaches the singularity, he leaves behind the creatures who led him there and crosses the event horizon. Here's the moment of Marco approaching it. The singularity itself was a chaotic mess. Sparks of light of all colors sizzled and exploded randomly out of it. Other beams of light spiraled dizzyingly around it as it spun. Some things seemed to be shooting into it, too. There was no order to it, no predicting when and where the next particular event would happen. From here, he could also see that it wasn't just light being spewed out of the thing. There were objects, too. Dust, rocks, even some things that seemed to be artifacts. Mechanisms, gadgets, springs, falling from it to the ground. You could say that it was like a cosmic revolving door. An object entered into it from one universe, and then could exit into an infinite number of other universes, all connected by the singularity's gravitational distortion of space-time. This is the crux of the world in Marco's Millions, the unknowable, the naked singularity, the cause of all the tension of time passing differently, and the mechanism for dimension hopping in alien worlds. Naked singularities are, I almost want to say a real thing, they're potentially real in quantum mechanical terms, which means they haven't been observed, but they haven't been mathematically disproven either. Although Sleater's description in the book of what might lead to their formation is a little simplified. There's a lot of reading you can do about evaporating black holes, universes modeled with different shapes and a different number of dimensions, and specific parameters of collapsing stars. The idea of them producing wormholes is rooted in the fact that the rules of physics as we know them would kind of fall apart in these kind of conditions. And once you start playing with infinities in your calculations, a lot more is possible than you think. Or at least, a lot more than you think isn't impossible. Now, Star Trek is wonderful for its futuristic setting and elaborate galaxy, but I also love this brand of science fiction. The kind that takes real science and gives it one quarter turn. That takes a theory and says, yes, what if... It makes that feeling of possibility so much closer and easier to reach for, and I think that's really the value science fiction, or speculative fiction more generally, has over fantasy. Don't get me wrong, I love fantasy. I love the escapism and the invented impossible, and the way it supports in equal weight the exhaustive world-building of some series, and the fanciful, and also this, magic of others. But in speculative fiction, you get to hold on to that lingering notion that in 50 years, 100 years, maybe Marco's travels aren't so unbelievable. Plus, any book that explains quantum mechanics to elementary school kids in a way that makes it not only easy to understand, but also as fascinatingly bizarre as it is, deserves some kind of praise. Marco's task is to find the stolen control box, exploring through the wormholes of the singularity. Telepathically guided once again by Lily, he selects the right one and enters another universe, another planet, another world, and in a marketplace finds his Aunt Martha, the previous medium, and discovers that she has stolen the master control box. She's content to let the singularity self-destruct, because at least she can escape it and continue traveling, forever young, forever seeking worlds far more interesting than those left behind. Our good protagonist Marco does not buy her temptation. He tricks her and steals the box back, and he returns to his traveling companions and then home. But because of the hoax of the singularity, it's been years. Lily, present throughout the book in a parallel storyline and telepathic voiceover into Marco's adventures, has died in a car crash, along with their parents, and it's just Ruth left, their younger sister. We're going to pause here to talk about character. I don't expect much from children's protagonists. I'd like them to be well-intentioned, I'd like them to be brave, I'd like them to love their friends and their family, and be eager for adventures that I can live alongside them. But I think it's easy to give them all the good, and maybe one sly little flaw to cause easy-to-solve conflict, and leave it at that. It's especially easy to write them as generic people, rather than asking how a child would actually be. I've been trying to decide if Marco's written to act older than he is, or would even do 12-year-olds act like, 
and I realized that when I first read the book, I was younger than Marco. So many years on, he stayed the same while I'm caught trying to test relatability from the other side. I don't think it occurred to me how fitting it was to start this podcast with a book about time travel, where the main character stays the same age while others grow up and grow older without him. Even with as little time as such a short book gives, Marco does have complexity. He's a conscientious traveler, like I talked about, and he's an older brother, protective of Lily, annoyed by Ruth, tempted by the chance to surpass both of them, and irritable when overlooked. I think there are books that better explore sibling relationships in and of themselves, but in Marco's Millions, what you're really getting is the story of one kid being forced to leave his family behind, in a way growing up before he's due and making his own way in the universe. It would be disingenuous to say that Marco feels wholly real to me, there's just not enough pages for that. But because of the way he approaches and thinks through problems he faces, he does feel close to real. Real adjacent. Real in the world through a neighboring wormhole. But Marco, while he is the main actor and protagonist, is not the only character in this book. And in fact, he doesn't even get the inciting incident. That belongs to Lily. Lily has her own concerns in the measures of realism and authenticity that we apply to characters. For sure, she is less multifaceted than Marco, a side effect of her responsibility in being the device through which the plot is manufactured. She is withdrawn into herself, sickly, sent frequently to doctors. Her largest deviation from kindness is in her plotting with Marco to exclude Ruth. She lies to her little sister and keeps her away from their secret, but even this is hard to believe as a character flaw when Ruth is designed to be so unlikable. For the storyline on Earth, much of it is embroiled in the context of money. This family lives in a large house, but it's an inheritance and they can't afford the upkeep. The parents complain about bills. Lily takes care of Ruth while their mother works nights. There's notes that they have fewer clothes and, quote, don't eat roast beef and steak like other families. But while Marco escapes this burden of reality, freed into the rest of the universe where there are no monetary costs to his travel, Ruth and Lily are stuck under it. Ruth despises it, ridicules the cheap, practical presents Lily gets for her 20th birthday. She feels of the world in a way that Lily doesn't, which, of course, is the point, even as it creates Lily as improbably understanding, placidly too kind, tragic, and too deserving of sympathy, while Ruth, annoying as a child, grows into a sneering teenager and a hateful, apathetic adult. Yet, in that, there is tragedy, too. For most stories, there's a boundary at which the text and the probable intended meanings end, and progression beyond is at the whim and responsibility of the reader. In reader response literary criticism, there's the idea that all stories are created just as much by the reader as the writer, that by the act of interfacing with the text and bringing with you a set of preconceptions, intentions, and opinions, you the reader, the listener, are fulfilling and defining what the story is. A different reader reads a different story. I don't fully subscribe to this method of literary analysis. I think it can be taken to extremes, where the author and the formation of the piece in its context and intent can be disregarded a little too easily. But I do agree that the level at which the reader is willing to engage with the story can vastly change how they understand it. And I also think it leads to a point at which the reader, if they so choose, can shoulder the task of creation where the writer has stopped. The narration of Marco's Millions has very little empathy for Ruth. She is whiny and self-centered, the concentrated sours of a youngest child. At first reading, I was horrified by her, could not imagine how she could keep on being so unpleasant when she could instead have been like ethereal Lily or wandering Marco. And yet now, I see her as the lead in her own tragedy. The reader feels for Lily, who is not well enough for her opportunity for adventure, and lives this mundane life that does not even have the charm of being long in its bittersweet parts. But Ruth never had a chance, and never looked for one. At the end of the book, she is 30. Her entire family is gone, except for Lily's infant daughter, who is certainly only an unasked-for responsibility and a reminder of loss in her eyes. 
and she is both ignorant of the magic in her own house and too hardened to appreciate it if she did know. I can't help but feel sad for her. It is otherwise interesting to note that the book's villain, Aunt Martha, while only present in one scene, is very nearly a conglomeration of the three siblings. She has Marco's desire and skill for travel, Lily's strangeness and sense of being untethered from the normal world, and Ruth's vicious viewpoint, out for herself first and foremost. While she is a fairly one-note villain, scarcely even a true antagonist, it's easy to imagine how she came to think the way she does. If you could go anywhere, do anything, live as long as you like and never answer to anyone, why should you bother with boring, ordinary life that doesn't concern you? Marco very nearly falls to this temptation, but because of those qualities I mentioned at the start, good intentioned, caring for his family, honest and believing in a way that child heroes can get away with, while only feeling a bit of naivete, he succeeds and is rewarded by the ability to travel all he wishes, but at the sacrifice of all chance of returning to his old life. Time left him behind. There is only a little left of the story as written. Lily, before she died, told Ruth that Marco would be coming back, and she didn't believe her until he did, not any older than when he left. There is small time given to Marco's shock and loss, and then he goes off to travel the universe through the singularity, coming back to watch Lily's daughter grow up. It's bizarrely existential and tragic in terms of the hero's journey of it all. It leaves you with a sobering feeling, which may be why it has stuck with me. When I read this the first time, I was not well-traveled. Obviously, I was a kid. And that's why I remember being so... Impressed isn't the right word. Maybe in awe of the way Marco manages in his traveling. Now, all it makes me think of is this feeling of being in another country. Like I said, of being a tourist. And desperately trying to move along with the flow of life without disturbing it too much and while learning everything you possibly can from being immersed in what you aren't familiar with. That's the kind of wonder this book hinges on, is whether the author can get the reader to believe in the vast network of worlds connected through the Singularity's wormholes. When Marco is hunting for the stolen master box, he explores a planet-wide city, which he describes as the spherical city because of the perspective the Singularity allows him to approach it from. That place feels real too, with street dances and vendors and a vibrancy that you can feel through the page, and you, or at least I, totally believe that it can exist in the same universe as the drab, shadowy world of the bug creatures with their haunted rituals. So at the end of the book, when Marco goes out traveling, you buy into his adventures without even seeing them in more than a few sketch descriptions. Buy into the infinite exploration. The kind where you can be small in comparison, but nonetheless significant. One aspect that I love about what I've termed playground books, these stories that we read as kids, is how they can feel like they exist only for us, only in that moment. I think we all have a little solipsism in us until we grow out of it, and I'm guilty as well. Marco's Millions existed for me on the bookshelf of my third grade classroom until I started researching for this review and discovered that it is a prequel. The story that follows, published a few years beforehand, is centered on Lily's daughter and her own time contending with the universes behind her basement wall, featuring a now grown-up Uncle Marco, intergalactic traveler, mysterious figure. I haven't read it. I might, at some point. But while I'm fond of nostalgia, I do not find much draw in regression. Even in selecting passages to read to you, I'm at odds with the simple phrasing, straightforward syntax, because I worry it somehow doesn't convey the mystery and existential, impossible atmosphere that I feel when I read it. Maybe that mostly comes out of my memory. Maybe I have created it along with the author. But even if so, Marco's Millions changed how I thought at eight years old, and in some way, it's affecting how I think even now. If you've read Marco's Millions or this discussion was interesting to you, I'd recommend Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for the same kind of you-are-small-in-a-strange-universe-now-go-explore-it feeling. 
or Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, specifically toward the end, where humanity has spread across the galaxy and forgotten the original location of Earth, and the protagonists are searching for it. It gets you to that same kind of untethered sobering. Maybe you can find your way back home. Maybe it or you will be too changed once you do. Thanks for listening. The music is by David Hillowitz. The book is by William Sleater. The opinions are by me. For the next episode, I'll be rereading Frindle by Andrew Clements. Talk to you then. Thank you.